So a couple logistical things as we get um, ready to start. So um, if you're not speaking, it would be good to um, mute, mute your microphone so we, we avoid having any feedback um, during anybody's presentations. Um, but you know, definitely we're, we're going to try and keep this semi-informal. So, um, but we are uh, also going to use the Slack channel for entering questions um, and, and fielding some of that. But I also want the, especially the science advisory board members to feel like they can come um, off mute and ask questions and contribute thoughts um, throughout uh, today's meeting. So, um, so welcome everybody to day one, I think. It looks like we have fallen off on who's joining and um, most of the people that I expected to tune in today um, are on. Um, and so uh, for those of you who are new on the Science Advisory Board, I'm Louisa Nance. I'm the director of the DTC. Um, we have invited um, our leads uh, to this meeting and hopefully you watched my introductory um, video where I included slide uh, pictures of all of them. Um, we have also invited our management board members, our executive committee members um, and the staff to participate if they um, want, um, not, you know, that was all optional. Um, and then we have a few invited speakers also. So um, we'll dive right in. Um, next slide, Jenny. Okay, so uh, I did distribute the um, agenda uh, to the group, but I just wanted to go over a little bit about expectations for what we're going to do today and what we're going to do tomorrow. So today, um, I was kind of trying to look at, you know, future outlook for the DTC. I'm going to go through some logistics to start with, and then I'm going to go through um, sort of some recent developments um, that will be impacting the DTC over the next couple of years. Um, and then we have a presentation by the Air Force, which is one of our partners. Um, Curtis is going to give us an outlook of, um, you know, the, the Air Force's take on, on where we're headed uh, with the DTC. Then Hendrik Tolman is going to give us a presentation on the um, Unified Forecast System R to O Stages and Gates um, uh, concept. And then um, Maui Huang is going to give us a presentation on EPIC. So, Anybody who's not quite familiar with what EPIC is yet um, will hopefully be um, informed um, and, and a, an update for those of you who are already familiar with what EPIC is but um, don't, aren't uh, aware of the current status. And just a minute, I just realized I forgot to shut my door. So. In the days of the epidemic, I don't want to interfere with my husband who's working downstairs. So. <laughs> We'll, uh, we'll, we'll then have some time for some questions and uh, for Q&A for um, the, those folks who presented this, will present this morning, um, and also some discussion um, from the group, and then have a break. And then, um, then the next part, we're really going to focus on testing evaluation. We'll have a couple of presentations from our leads, um, and then a guest speaker, Dave Turner, is going to come in and give us some uh, thought-provoking slides about ingredients for um, testing, testing evaluation and, and really digging deep on that. Um, then we'll have some more general discussion. Um, this will be a, a time period for um, the Science Advisory Board to ask any questions um, that they might have. Um, also to start uh, sharing thoughts about where you think the DTC should be headed. Um, then we'll have a break, and then there's going to be a time period at the end of the day for the Science Advisory Board to start meeting just among yourselves. Um, so I will be available if there's any questions. Um, Jenny will stay online. She's our logistical support. Um, just in case you run into any technical difficulties with the Google Meet um, or need to get in touch with someone, um, she'll, she'll be there in the background um, just to provide uh, support for that. So then tomorrow, what I want to turn to um, is talking about expanding expanding our community engagement. So we will start off tomorrow morning with um, just some 
thoughts being shared from some of the science advisory board members. And I tried to pick from the, we have a diverse group. Um, so I tried to pick from the different um, uh, types of members. So private sector, um, NASA, academia, um, and, and then the Naval Navy, the Naval Research Laboratory. Um, then we'll follow that with more discussion, um, have a break. And then once again, the science advisory board, you'll have a science advisory board only um, time period to discuss. And that's when you can start Con or continue formulating um, ideas of things you'd like to recommend. Um, and then um, we'll come back after another break and um, you can share your initial thoughts, um, your emerging themes, and then we can have a little bit more discussion. Um, and then that will wrap up the meeting for the, um, the second day. So next slide. So what I wanted to do now is, um, and we don't, we, there's no way we can go around and introduce everybody who is on the meeting today. But I did want, because I want the Science Advisory Board members to get to know each other a little bit and be able to feel like they can chat with each other, um, what I'd like to ask is, for those of you who are on today, let's go through the list in order. And if you could um, come off your mic, and oh, so not um, go back one, Jenny. Um, and and if you if you feel comfortable, turn on your camera if you have a camera, and introduce yourself and just briefly say something about your background. So we have a diverse group with lots of different expertise, and so I thought it would be good um, this ever so briefly go through this. So if we can start with Alex, pretty sure you're there. Um, maybe not. Yannick, are you? I didn't see Yannick on. This may not go so well. Um, Mian, are you on? Yes, I am here. Um, uh, my name is Mian Chen from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, my background is the um, atmospheric uh, chemistry and aerosol modeling, um, doing a mostly global model, but also um, a little bit of experience on the regional model as well. Um, so that's all. All right, thanks. Um, let's see, I do not see Yvette on. Um, oh, yeah, so I could hear me on. Um, Be Becky, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Huh. All right. Okay, I'm not quite sure what happened there. We'll try another right, one I'll to just, see how that goes. Oh my goodness, I'll I just figured out. I, yeah, okay. I left somebody on here who's not on here anymore. Gretchen's not with us anymore. Um, she's a management board member. I've got a typo. Let's see. I don't think Shuang is with us. Okay, so Alex, can you um, can you try signing off and sign back in? Okay, there's always something that happens, technical difficulties. All right, um, I think we have Clark is here. Hi, everyone. I'm Clark Evans from UW-Milwaukee. I study high-impact weather using uh, mesoscale model simulations. I've often had issues with sound on these meetings as well, and I found that it's pretty browser sensitive, so I hope everybody's able to uh, find something that works for them. Yes, that's true. Um, sometimes it's if you have more than one um, mic available and it gets screwed up about which one it's uh, thinking it's using. So anyway, Hoya? Hi, I'm Hoya. Uh, can you hear me? Hi, so I'm Hoya Zhuang. I'm a post-processing lead at EMC. Um, I'm definitely no stranger to DTC. I think I'm one of the first EMC people uh, working with DTC since DTC started. Um, the last 
five or six years, I've also been working with the ICING and Turbulence Group of UNCAR to bring their um, um, aviation algorithm into the UPP. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm really, I was very excited to join last year, and this year I'm still excited and hope to collaborate with everybody um, on R2O and O2R. Thank you. Thanks, Hoya. Um, okay. So, Mike, are you on? Mm, yeah. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. No echo? Nope, no echo. Okay. So I'm Mike Toy. I'm with uh, NOAA GSL in uh, Boulder. I work in the uh, physics development uh, team in the um, um, uh, model development uh, uh, division. And um, let's see, I work on gravity wave drag parameterization development, and I'm working on the UFS R2O project, uh, getting the unified gravity wave drag suite implemented in uh, version 17 of the FP3 GFS. I've been with NOAA for GSL for about four years um, in uh, developing uh, physics parameterizations, but before that I had uh, experience working uh, developing dynamical cores. Um, and I'm happy to be serving. This is my second year on the Science Advisory Board. Thanks, Mike. Um, Bob Hallberg? Yes, I'm Robert Hallberg, um, Bob Hallberg, from NOAA GFTL in Princeton, New Jersey, where I am one of the lead developers of the MOM6 ocean model, and I've also done a lot of work in sea ice modeling. Um, I am one of the members of the steering committee of the, the UFS marine uh, team. So we deal with the oceans, the sea ice, um, things that are have not been quite so active within UFS as UFS has been focused on kind of getting really world-class seven-day forecasts, but, but something that might be becoming a little bit more prominent as, as UFS uh, moves forward to longer time scales and, and broader parts of the Earth system. This is my second year on the Science Advisory Board. Thanks, Bob. Israel? Hi, I'm Israel Yurok. I'm the Science and Operations Officer at the NOAA NWS Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma. So I'm involved, obviously, with operational severe weather forecasting and fire weather forecasting. I've also done some development and testing of uh, CAM Ensemble products, um, including calibrated uh, severe weather hazards. And I'm involved with the hazardous weather testbed and the planning and, and organizing, facilitating of experiments there, specifically the spring forecasting experiment. So I've been involved with DTC projects in, in that realm, especially, um, and this is my second year on the Science Advisory Board. Thanks, Israel. Um, Christian? Hi, everybody. I'm Christian Jablonowski. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan in the Atmospheric Sciences. And this is my second year uh, here on the board. My, my research is a, I'm a dynamical core person. I also develop weather and climate models. I currently co-lead the couple model developments for the UFS in the R2O project. And I'm also serving on uh, a diverse yeah, collection of NCAR committees. So I'm a scientific steering committee member for NCAR CSM, also co-lead of the Atmospheric Working Group at NCAR. All right, thanks. Chris? Yeah, I'm Chris Mielek. Uh, I'm with the 16th Weather Squadron at Offutt Air Force Base. This is my first year on the Science Advisory Board. And uh, I'm on the model verification team. Uh, I have kind of quite a bit of background working at SPC as a federal contractor. I was involved with the spring experiments, kind of like, um, you know, with Israel. So, and then prior to that, uh, I worked in the private sector at Barron Services. And my research interests include winter weather, lightning, severe convective storms, and any other high impact weather phenomenon that could be evaluated from high resolution uh, numerical weather models and ensembles. Thanks, Chris. Becky? Hi. Uh, I think I got my uh, audio visual issues fixed. Uh, my name is Becky Adam Seelan. I'm a senior staff scientist at Atmospheric and Environmental Research. That's a private company in uh, Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, my current interests um, that are probably most related to the DTC 
are um, I do a, a lot of interest or a lot of research into hail, hail formation, and hail forecasting, um, and validating um, hail and and all convective hazards. Um, also interested in uh, using dynamic downscaling to uh, forecast or attempt to analyze um, uh, high impact events uh, uh, that require high resolution, hence the dynamic downscaling uh, to, to observe or predict. Um, back in the day, probably 10, actually 10 years ago, um, I also worked at the um, 16th Weather Squadron um, and worked some with DTC in validating um, precipitation and, and ensemble forecasts, um, as well as cloud forecasts um, from, uh, from the Air Force. So I've, I've gotten to, to see DTC at work in a, in a range of um, arenas. Thanks, Becky. Lisa? Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Bengtsson. I um, moved to Boulder from Sweden uh, in 2017, and I'm uh, with Ceres and NOAA Estrel PSL. My, um, I guess, research interest and research background is in convective parameterization and stochastic physics parameterization. And in recent, in recent year and a half, I've been also co-leading the UFS physics, um, what's it called, the uh, R2O physics subproject uh, of the UFS and uh, have gotten to work with a lot of DTC folks through that project. This is my uh, first year on the DTC uh, Science Advisory Board, so I'm looking forward to the discussions and see what you're all up to. Thanks, Lisa. Ryan? There you are. Sorry, they're testing the fire drill in and off right now. So I just oh. kind of posted my introduction in there because I didn't think anybody wanted to hear that going on. So, oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Julio? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm Julio Backmeister. I'm a, a climate scientist in the climate and uh, global dynamics division or lab at, at NCAR in Boulder. Uh, I work on uh, atmospheric model physics mostly. Um, I've worked on gravity wave schemes as well as convection and clouds. Um, uh, uh, like Christiana, I'm, I'm a co-lead of the atmospheric model working group for CSM and this is my first year and uh, my first meeting on this uh, science advisory board. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, yeah, I am also looking forward to uh, hearing and participating in the discussions. Thanks. Thanks, Julio. And Gudrun? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Gudrun Magnus' daughter from um, University of California, Irvine. Uh, I'm professor of Earth System Science, so I come from this multi or interdisciplinary group of scientists uh, dealing with the Earth system um, as a coupled integrated system. So uh, my background is in atmospheric dynamics, uh, large-scale atmospheric dynamics. I look at teleconnections and um, air-sea interaction and anything to do with large-scale dynamics. So very broad range of problems that I've worked on in the past. And uh, recently I've become, I've worked on sea ice, uh, interaction of sea ice with the atmosphere, Arctic amplification, causes and consequences. But recently, I've also gotten very interested in seasonal uh, predictability. So what can we learn from the large scales uh, in that arena? So I'm, I'm very much at the fringe of this group. I, I, I look forward to a lively discussion and, and learning from all of you. So I hope I can contribute in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you. And Alex, are you back with us? I hope so. Yes, you are. I hear okay. you. Great. Uh, my name is Alex Reinick. I'm uh, the head of the mesoscale modeling section at the Naval Research Laboratory uh, at the Marine Meteorology Division, which is in Monterey, California. Um, I'm the lead PI of the uh, development of the next generation um, numerical weather prediction system for the Navy, which is called Neptune. Uh, which is on track to transition to our operational partners in uh, FY23. Uh, previously, I've led projects such as the COEMS-TC Ensemble 
operational transition and development, which was the uh, world's first uh, high resolution ensemble uh, prediction system to be operationalized. Um, and this is my third year on the, uh, the science advisory board. All right, did I, I think I caught everybody who is on the science advisory board who is here. Um, so welcome everyone. And as you see, we have a, a mix of people who have been on the board for three years, two years and one year. So um, next slide. So uh, just, to, just to make sure everybody understands what, what we're hoping for from the science advisory board, first of all, we have a, a chair, it's a rotating one year term. And I usually try and tap somebody who um, has been with us for a year already. So a second year member, um, so that then the following year they can provide support for whoever is the lead. And um, thanks to Mike Toy for uh, stepping up and volunteering to be our fearless leader for the science advisory board this year. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this is all, it's, it's basically just him trying to shepherd forward, um, collecting recommendations. So, um, you know, it's not just up to him to put the report together. It's, it's up to all the members to contribute in whatever way they, they feel is appropriate, um, given their background. So, um, the science advisory board, um, we want this to be a forward looking, um, group that's focused on science-based, uh, strategic recommendations. Um, so not, not budgetary and programmatic issues, more in terms of um, trying, to, trying to help us forward with the science. Um, the SAB recommendations should be made in context of, of awareness of DTC capabilities and constraints. So that's why uh, some of that stuff I provided as uh, background material for Read Ahead. Um, we'll also be showing you some of the context of our partnership um, over the next day. Um, those kind of things. So, so keep all those things in mind. Um, we want the science advisory board recommendations to be actionable and relevant to the development of the, the DTC's um, annual operating plan. Um, and also for our forward looking planning that we're hoping to be able to do more of in the future. Um, the science advisory board uh, should maintain its independence and should not be constrained in its discussions or recommendations. Um, one thing is that this particular science advisory board is not a FACA committee, so there is no need to develop some kind of consensus. Um, so when you're putting your report together, um, you know, if anybody has any member of the science advisory board has some thoughts they want to share, that is perfectly fine. Even if the rest of the science advisory board members don't all agree on that, this is a collection of thoughts about where the DTC should be going forward. We do have participation of the operational centers on um, the science advisory board. So you saw that there was um, Hoya is with um, EMC and, and Chris is with the Air Force. Um, and that participation allows for some direct dialogue within um, the science advisory board. Um, so provide some grounding there and, and sort of a reality check with respect to that. Next slide. Um, oh, what happened? Can you click, Jenny? I don't. Something disappeared on the slide. No, well, I guess it. I guess it's just not going to show up. So if you look, there's the the blue bar over in the far left hand side. Um, so there is a channel on the Slack that is called discussion day one session. So that's where um, I post the discussion questions for today. Um, and that's the, the channel that we'd like for you to post any thoughts or questions that you have um, throughout today. And so our staff are also have access to this um, and we'll be monitoring this throughout the day. Um, we can respond to some of the um, things that are posted there um, offline. And we can also use that as a way to um, look for questions that when we get to the Q&A and the discussion, um, we'll be looking in there too. Um, so that's, and, and if anyone has problems getting into Slack, please let Jenny and I know, and we will try and help you troubleshoot in the background. Um, cause this is a, an important mechanism platform for supporting this, this virtual type meeting. Next slide. Okay. Now it came back. 
<laughs> All right, whatever, technical difficulties. Um, okay, so I wanted to move on to um, uh, talking about some recent developments that are impacting the DTC. And so I'm going to cover two main areas. And one is this memorandum of agreement on infrastructure that was um, developed between NCAR and NOAA. And then um, give you some brief background on some guidance that we've gotten from our executive committee. Uh, so next slide. So um, there was a memorandum of agreement that uh, was put together between NCAR um, and the two aspects of NOAA and NWS and OAR um, that was signed back in January of 2019. Um, and this agreement is valid for five years. Um, and it, it's focused on modeling infrastructure. So this was aimed at creating a strategic relationship of mutual benefit for developing infrastructure to en enable the broader community to engage in improving the nation's weather and, and climate modeling capabilities for both operations and research. So it's, uh, it, it's a commonality of areas where we realize that um, to co-develop these would be more effective than for NOAA to be off developing its own infrastructure and NCAR to be developing a separate in infrastructure. Um, so it's a joining of forces, I guess you would say. So the benefits from this include um, some inter efficiencies and synergies between the modeling systems. Um, we end up with common community code repositories um, that able, enable R to O and O to R transitions. Um, and it eases the community access to NOAA operational models and tools. So next slide. Um, so basically the scope of this memorandum of agreement was to seek uh, coordination um, of existing and ongoing investments of NOAA and NCAR. So before the MOA was signed, we were already actually um, working on uh, developing pieces of inf shared infrastructure. And so this kind of more formalized that. And in the agreement, we, we um, focused on seven key elements um, and, and one being the coupling between components. So between atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, um, waves, that kind of thing. Um, and then coupling within a component. So intra-component coupling, um, workflow, uh, how you run the system, quality assurance testing uh, in model development, um, forecast verification, um, software repository ma management, and user and, and developer support. So those were the seven areas that that agreement focused on. Uh, next slide. So this just shows you some um, examples of ongoing areas. So um, we've got uh, co-development um, of component coupling, which is this next generation CMIPS um, coupler, um, then atmospheric physics framework, um, workflow coordination, um, you can see the list here. So if you click one more time, Jenny. So I'm gonna briefly go over two main areas that the DTC is um, intimately involved in with respect to this infrastructure. And one is the common community physics package and the other one is MET plus. Um, next slide. So MET plus um, is a verification uh, validation package. Um, and this package was developed through investments from NCAR, NOAA, and the Air Force over the past decade. So um, the, the DTC was central to getting this um, community tool started. And um, so now it can compute over 100 traditional statistics and diagnostic methods. Um, and the capability to evaluate cu coupled model frameworks is, is on the horizon. So that's under development. Um, it's important to note that, that while the partnership for the DTC is between uh, NCAR, NOAA, and the Air Force, that um, some of our tools that we've developed are actually being used by other agencies. Um, so for instance, the Naval Research Laboratory, um, the UK Met Office, um, and the Unified Model Partners are also um, adopting MET as, as their verification tools. So um, by them investing in and using that tool, um, the DTC partners and the broader community, because this is a community tool that we support it to the community, um, are going to be benefiting from all these um, advancements that go into the package that are sponsored by the broader community. So next slide. And then the common community physics package. Now this is a, this is a framework for um, 
coupling together um, atmospheric physics with um, the, the dynamic core is, the, is sort of the central aspect of this. And um, NCAR and the DTC have, have agreed to jointly advance this framework that was originally developed by um, the DTC for NOAA. Um, and so there's been work that's been going on to, they jointly designed an advanced framework, so taking it to the next um, level. Um, and then our, the implementation is a collaborative effort where um, NCAR CGD was taking on the central aspects of the implementing the design. And then the DTC is augmenting that design by adding um, other capabilities. So the outlook for this is that um, this physics framework would be used by NCAR's um, SEMA, uh, which is a, an effort that's underway for a more coordinated um, shared infrastructure between the community models for NCAR. And also it, uh, this next gen, so the current framework is already within UFS, the Unif NOAA's Unified Forecast System. Um, and then this next generation system would also be um, integrated into that. Um, and so most recently, going beyond the framework, we have convened representatives from, from NOAA, so both EMC and the NOAA laboratories, um, NCAR and the Naval Research Laboratory, to discuss collaborative approaches to managing uh, uh, the, the physics part. So there's the framework part that allows the connection between the physics and the dynamics, and then there's actually the, the physics um, code itself. So we've been having ongoing discussions about how to best set up that collaborative framework that will meet the broad needs of this group. So both operations and research. So next slide. Okay, so moving on to, you know, the most recent guidance we've had from the DTC Executive Committee um, is that they've asked us to um, work towards reducing our software support activities and pivot towards more of a focus on testing evaluation activities. So um, the, the process of doing this is we are dis discontinuing support over this next, this current performance period for legacy systems. Um, so that the, um, NOAA's operational data assimilation system, the GSI ENKF system and its hurricane wharf um, system. So um, because those the, the, the plan is to eventually retire those um, software systems from um, operations. So development is now on the next generation systems instead. Um, with EPIC, which you're gonna hear more about, we are looking at transitioning aspects of our general UFS application support, um, including the unified post-processor, it's an integral part of that, um, to EPIC. Um, now the timeline for that transition is still um, to be determined, um, but and and we realize that we need to have a smooth transition of those responsibilities because the the community is already relying on the support that we're providing, and we we don't want a gap there. So um, we'll be carefully working with the Epic Program Office to determine how um, we transition our responsibilities and how soon we can we can step back from those. Um, at the same time, we are um, planning to continue our support for the infrastructure pieces that were developed by the DTC. So um, the common community physics package with its single column model and then the MET plus package. So it's not like we would be totally stepping back from software support, but um, as you saw in the introductory slides, it's a sizable piece of our current budget um, goes towards software support. So if we're able to step back um, from these support activities, we would have a significantly larger chunk of money to put towards testing evaluation. So um, then the other thing that the executive committee has asked us to do is explore avenues for strengthening our ties with the NWP community. So we've seen that other agencies are involved uh, engaging with the infrastructure that was developed by the DTC. So, you know, are there um, ways that we can um, develop, a, um, uh, do we need to develop a more formalized collaboration or, or um, is less formal okay on those fronts, but how can we benefit from all of these groups working together? And, and really strengthening our ties with the community is, is core to our mission. So this is something that we want to um, 
to discuss with this group and, and hear ideas about how we can strengthen those ties. Um, because it's not, it, it's not like the DTC is developing all these in, innovations itself. We're trying to work with enabling the community being able to get those innovations into operations. Um, next slide. <laughs> So I'm not going to go through all these. This is these are the questions that are listed um, that I posted on the Slack channel. Um, just to kind of we're looking at you know what are the big science questions um, that we uh, should be looking at trying to address over the next few years. Um, what if anything is missing from the framework that we're supporting in order to enable research and operations to work together um, on evaluating. Uh, new innovations and looking at their merits and 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 providing feedback to the developers about things that maybe the weaknesses that are there. Um, and you know how do we how do we build up this this uh, T and E capability and and make sure that we're having um, we're doing impactful activities um, that are um, not just one off things that that don't have uh, an influence on where things are going with, with respect to numerical weather prediction models. Um, so that is all I had for now. And I know we're running a little bit late, um, pardon my assessment of the schedule. So I'd like to go ahead and move on to um, Curtis's presentation. Curtis, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Can everybody, can anybody else besides me, since somebody else? All right. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Evan. All right, Curtis, take it away. All righty. Uh, good. Uh, I guess this morning. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Major Curtis Schubeck. I'm the Chief of Weather Prediction Strategy over here at the Pentagon. And I am also a representative, or you, the Air Force representative to the management board on the DTC. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna give you kind of, I know there are some new members to the science advisory board here. Um, so some of you might've already seen components of this brief, but to others, it may be new. So I'm just gonna give you guys a quick background on what we do and kind of transition towards the end on to what are some of our big research initiatives and what are some of our big concerns going into the future um, are. Next slide. So our overall, uh, our weather operational mission, this kind of gives you an idea of, of, of where we're coming from. So our mission is to maximize the combatant, com combat, combatant command's lethality. And this instance is uh, Air Combat Command through the exploitation of timely, accurate, and relevant authoritative terrestrial and space environmental intelligence anytime, anywhere. So that is our mission statement there. And of course, you cannot have an Air Force weather brief without some pictures of some F-22s. But this gives you an idea of some of those things that we support. So, it, you know, our weather support is the typical aviation support, everything from uh, icing, uh, turbulence, uh, visibility for you know air, air refueling, um, and also surface vis visibility for and crosswinds. You know your typical aviation support, but also in things like clouds for um, for ISR, which is intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. So we have a wide range of uh, mission types that we support in the Air Force. Um, and because of that, we have quite a wide range of products that we need. So our vision uh, as the Air Force Weather is to uh, provide world-class airmen, um, which hopefully I'm part of that, uh, the DOD's provider of choice for innovative, actionable, and authoritative, authoritative terrestrial and space weather information to win the fight today and tomorrow. So. These next few slides, I'll kind of talk to you about what it is that we are doing today, and then we'll transition into what is motivating us uh, for tomorrow and what kind of guidance we're getting for how we need to shape our force and shape our modeling capabilities. Uh, next slide, please. So the GALWIM, which is the Global Air Land Weather Exploitation Model, that is our global model. Um, that provides the primary primary numerical model output for Air Force and Army operations. We run it four times a day out to 240 hours at approximately a 17 kilometer horizontal resolution. Uh, 
still on the books of the plans to upgrade that resolution in, uh, to 10 kilometers once we fully operationalize our System 11. System 11, um, I'll try not to use too many acronyms, I apologize, but System 11 is our is our new HPC that gives us approximately seven times the compute capacity of our current um, of our current HPC. Right now, we're running a, we're running version ten point nine of the UM, um, and we're feeding that with a couple different types of data. So, uh, this next bullet here, I, I mentioned here that we have a hybrid forty var uh, data simulation um, based on five fifty seventh organic and UK Met Office observational data. We're currently not, we're, we're trying to transition out of that. We actually have the capability to do in-house DA as needed, but right now we're actually just taking the raw dump files directly from the Met Office. It just proved to actually uh, provide us a little bit of benefit in terms of, of, uh, um, of both the quality of the forecast, but also reduce the manning requirements for us. But um, once we take all that data from the gallon, we're able to shoot it out on a product that we are website that we call AFWEBS, and that is uh, how we make our data data available to our Army and Air Force customers. Uh, next slide, please. So a few other products that we use: um, we use the Global Ensemble Prediction System or the GEPS. This is probably one of my favorite products, something I've used a lot when I was a forecaster over at Andrews Air Force Base, and also. Um, at Cape Canaveral. Um, we know, most of us probably know that it is a product composed of 63 members from the National Weather Service, the Canadian Modeling Center, and the U.S. Navy. Um, and we are trying to eventually get our GALWIM into that, into the, our GALWIM Global Ensemble into that mix as well. So we have our, our GALWIM Global Ensemble, which is a 16-day forecast um, composed of 21 members. Um, Last I heard, it was 40 kilometers. Um, that might have been enhanced a little bit, or maybe there are plans to increase that resolution once we transition to uh, System 11. Um, but like I mentioned, it's had 21 members, and we add that to the 63 member, we would have an 84 member suite in our, our Global Ensemble Prediction Center, our system. And our initial test, at least in-house, has shown improvements with the Galloom added. Um, Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm going to cough. Need a cough button. So we also uh, run some uh, regional models. Um, we currently, uh, our current regional models are based off off the wharf. Uh, we have no separate mesoscale DA. Everything is initialized uh, directly from our global models. Uh, just to give you an example of some of the mesoscale regions that we want run for our mesoscale ensemble prediction system, uh, we have 21 total model domains. 13 of them are static and eight are re relocatable based on mission uh, mission needs. Uh, of some of those static ones, we have the 20 kilometer very large window. Uh, just to give you an example, they can take up the northern hemisphere and tropical regions. They forecast out to 24 hours or 72 hours. I apologize. And some higher resolution uh, windows based off of, you know, needing improved forecasting for terrain or convection or tropical systems. And even we can go even higher resolution. We have um, some windows forecasting about, uh, about five one kilometer windows um, for areas of uh, very high, uh, um, what am I looking for? Very uh, Oh man, I just completely lost my word. Mine, uh, complex terrain. There you go. One of those examples would be somewhere um, like Cape Canaveral, for instance, where we have the onset of convection is extremely important for Cape Canaveral, particularly for uh, launching of launching of rockets or even doing day-to-day -day operations when they're stacking uh, boosters or loading payloads or whatever you have. But well, that initiation of convection is a lot of times on calm days, uh, very uh, dependent on. Uh, land and sea breezes that take place between the banana and the Indian River. So it's very complex, the uh, terrain over there and running it at a higher resolution model uh, benefits us there. And then those last two uh, bullets, they kind of somehow made their way back into the slide, but you can ignore those ones. And then the last uh, last slide there, or last bullet is, um, well, last bullet, there you go, thank you 
is that as of uh, in the next few days, by the end of this week, we will actually no longer be running any deterministic uh, uh, deterministic regional windows. We will only be running our global uh, our global model and our our global ensemble and our regional ensembles. Uh, as the mission in Afghanistan has kind of uh, ended for us, we no longer need to run any deterministic windows. So that should be in by the end of the week, which is a pretty significant uh, deal for us. All right, next slide, please. All right, so transitioning into, into the future, our guidance for how we're going to do things in the future is pretty much dictated by the National Defense Strategy that came out in 2018. And uh, I won't go into too much detail about the National Defense Strategy, but the general uh, outline is that, that interstate strategic competition, uh, not terrorism, is now the primary concern for U.S. national security. So in order to uh, affect that, uh, a more lethal, resilient, and rapidly innovating joint force combined with a robust, robust constellation of allies, partners, uh, will, be ne will be needed to sustain the Department of Defense in, in the future fight, if you will. So this, this document um, really is based, it, it's, it's for the DOD as, a, as an entirety. And what we've done at Air Force Weather is we've taken out um, some of the things that we can do to support that mission and tailored it into our Air Force uh, Weather strategic vision. Um, so what are, can we do as Air Force Weather to help support the national defense strategy? And just to give you an idea, so, you know, the, these three bullets, the main bullets here from the national defense strategy, you know, lethality and readiness, you know, one of the things that we can do to support that and under the idea of enhancing our resiliency, I'll get into later, but that's one of our main, one of our big concerns right now is enhancing resiliency. That is, you know, making sure that we have the data to continue to constrain our models and to continue to run our models and to continue to support I, what, you, what we would call our operators or our customers. Uh, we're also uh, relying heavily on partners. I think that's been, it's been that way for Air Force weather before the National Defense Strategy, but it's even kind of been bolstered even more since the National Defense Strategy. But uh, we work with DOD and government agencies, allies, and uh, industry and academia, and the DTC is, is, is a prime example uh, of that. And then, of course, the last bullet, you know, reforming for, uh, for performance and affordability. Um, rapidly modernizing is is one of our key objectives you know uh, making sure that we have the best modeling system that we can that we can have and also staying on top of what our customers or our operators are going to need in the future as new weapon systems come online we need to kind of be aware of how we can what we can do to support those missions next slide please so if I was to just kind of clean all of what I just said about, you know, our future and put it into objectives, we have three primary objectives. Well, obviously, one of them is to improve, evolve, and sustain our existing capabilities to meet our current uh, current customers, our current operators' needs. Um, but also, we need to provide capabilities to meet meet gaps. So we need to stay aware of what is uh, what is coming and what types of products that we're, are we going to need. But we also need to add resilience to our modeling system. And I'll, I'll hit on resilience again. I don't want to drop that word too many times without really adding any context to it. But one of the last slides, I will kind of I will kind of explain that a little bit more. But when I say resilience, I want you to think that. If once again, if communication goes down, if we lose uh, if we lose data through our typical WMO sources, um, if we lose satellite data, if we lose upper air ops, aircraft observations, that kind of thing, what can we do to mitigate that? Um, what is the minimum data amount of data that we would need to constrain a global or regional model so that we can still provide our customers with the needed cap needed uh, forecast products uh, next slide please so some of our challenges obviously with the pursuing those objectives obviously is that the the future challenge of the near peer conflict um, well we don't know what the near peer, uh, the the peer conflict is going to look like um, but uh, and we don't know what future weapon systems are going to be that are going to become come online. Um, but we need to make sure that we can meet 
obviously the current um, current objectives, the current requirements, but also somehow plan um, for the future, for future modeling systems. And of course, you know, th where we run into issues is, well, I think everyone does, this is not just Air Force weather, but operational needs are not always aligned with the strategic goals in a constrained environment. And what I mean by that is that, you know, constrained, I mean, both in terms of manning and, and, and uh, monetary uh, resources, uh, you know, sometimes the operations take take precedence and it can be very difficult to try to put money towards um, planning for the future when you're trying to uh, literally keep your lights on. Um, that's just an analogy that <laughs> Air Force isn't trying to keep their lights on. Um, anyway, so also the, US, the Air Force does not have uh, any in-house researching uh, research lab dedicated to uh, research, development, and testing, and evaluation uh, for weather modeling capabilities. Um, so that is why we rely on our partners uh, like the DTC or the Joint Center or um, um, the Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, that's where we get a lot of our research um, research work uh, done. Uh, next slide, please. Did a little, okay, there we go, there we go, it's popped up. So in line with some of our objectives, um, our research in, uh, interests, I kind of align them with our previous objectives of improving, involving, sustaining our initial capabilities. So in, in terms of improving uh, capabilities, um, well, no, actually, let me step back a little bit. Just to be clear, we still heavily rely, um, and I don't think there's going to be any change, but we still have to rely on the, the DTC for model evaluation research efforts and the development of verification tools. Uh, for instance, as was mentioned earlier, Met, Met Plus, Met Viewer, and, and that and that is a large part of uh, our, where our annual funding goes. And I think in the future, and we are still going to heavily rely on that for model evaluation and verification um, for, you know, for some of our, for instance, high resolution uh, um, models that we, are, we would like to run in the future. So just to give an example, some of the things that we're pursuing are some of our big interests for Air Force weather. Um, obviously, we're, well, not obviously, but we're pursuing explicit cloud uh, forecast capabilities. Uh, Air Force cares about clouds for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, it can be anywhere from intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance to just day-to-day -day operations. Uh, but we're looking for ways to get uh, to better forecast cloud movement as opposed to using, you know, some of the legacy systems that are um, just taking a cloud and, you know, invecting it basically using upper level winds, you know, we want to use high resolution cloud modeling. Um, and, you know, the verification and analysis of that high perform or a high resolution cloud modeling it will be required and it will be extremely important to us. Um, in terms of land, uh, our land information system or hydrology modeling, water security and land usage, um, drought and flood mitigation, those are a big part of uh, 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 actually a big part of the national defense strategy, but also a big part of, of the president's initiative on focusing on climate change and ways that we can mitigate the impacts of, of climate change. And a big one on that, I think, would be probably water security and how, you know, water security can, can um, and how it relates to the destabilization or stabilization uh, of areas in drought-stricken or drought-stricken areas. Um, another area of interest uh, when it comes to actually enhancing our capabilities would be uh, is synthetic clouds. And this is kind of a, something that was given to me as just an idea, you know, um, is if we could uh, direct research um, on whether synthetic clouds provide an accurate alternative cloud analysis uh, when compared to uh, cloud advection uh, uh, schemes. Um, Sorry, my daughter seems to be jumping around upstairs. If you guys hear that, um, another you know, for instance, can synthetic clouds provide more than just a cloud mask? You know, saying yay, yes or no, there are clouds over this area, but can they also provide us insight into some of the electromagnetic spectrum impacts on the forecast? Because we do care about that for uh, a multitude of reasons. We care about the uh, electromagnetic spectrum um, on weapon systems and whatnot. So in terms of adding resiliency, as I mentioned, uh, you know, th there are multiple ways that we're looking to attack this. This is a very 
uh, difficult problem. If you consider numerical modeling, how heavily reliant it is on both data and computing, uh, both of which are uh, susceptible to power outages, data outages, um, you name it. It's it almost uh, it almost seems like an impossible task to somehow ensure that we can continue to um, provide our data, you know, provide our, our, our weather products and a data denied, i.e. like a, a hacking type situation or a power outage situation. Um, but the way that we're going to, we're trying to address that is through, uh, through cloud computing. Cloud being, you know, uh, not the white puffy clouds, but cloud as in, um, computing that's disaggregated, you know, in different areas across the, the United States or the globe. Um, looking at classified computing, that would be taking um, our HPC, for instance, or moving at least parts of that uh, into higher, what we call enclaves, you know, moving it from, uh, from the unclassified level to like uh, secret or top secret or you name it. Um, to hopefully have, a, you know, to still maintain some capability um, when the lower enclaves are, are going down, but also using things like non-traditional non -traditional and commercial data sources. We've been ex exploring this at least for the last couple of years. Um, it's using uh, products that are typically not, you know, used for weather. So, you know, but, but they, we might be able to kind of rig them a little bit to maybe provide some ability or, some way of constraining a model using that data. Um, also, and I think this is a big one that, um, you know, I think we all really need to be thinking about is modeling operations with limited data sets. We really need to figure out like what, what is the minimum data that we would need to actually run a model? Um, and how can we secure that, uh, that data? And I, just to give you an example, and this is me just kind of thinking of, you know, off the top of my head, but, you know, it, WAMO, our world meteorological data, our, our upper air observations and our surface OBS, you know, are, are we confident that we would be able to get them if comms uh, went down for whatever reason? Um, you know, are there some satellite observations that we can somehow secure via, via various means that we could somehow use to constrain our model? What is the, what is the absolute amount of, what is the minimum amount of data that we would need to initialize those models that they would at least be better than persistence or better than climatology. So we have some sort of product um, that may, may or may not be valuable to, uh, to others, but that is something that the Air Force is thinking about. We wanna make sure that we have at least some product to continue our operations and provide to our customers. Um, and another way we're looking at resilience is just actually taking uh, model products from various customers, you know, uh, NOAA, Navy, uh, the UK Met Office, our own in-house in model, and being able to blend those products together so that, you know, and when times are good and we are able to get all the data, we actually have an excellent product that is a result of blending of multiple excellent global models. But as we start losing comms or data starts going down, we would still, you know, hopefully be able to maintain something. Um, I know that, you know, that's essentially what we're looking at there. These are the, these are the big things that we're we're, we're focusing on. Um, I think I might have, I don't think I have any more slides. So yeah, w with that, I know that kind of shot over a lot of things, but any, any questions? Do we have like one quick question? We do have a Q and A at the end. Um, Bob, do you want to? Could, could you identify in as much specificity as you're or able to, what is it that the U.S. Air Force is looking for out of DTC? What is it that DTC is doing that you find most valuable? What could DTC be doing in the coming years that you would find most valuable? I think right now, and 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 I have another folk uh, gentleman on here, Chris Malik, if he wants to add something too, in case I I, I mess this one up. But really, um, I think it's our validation and verification tools. I think that's primarily what we're using the DTC for right now. Um, but yeah, model verification, uh, that, that, would, that would be it. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's, it's something that we've used for quite a while, but our problem is that we've been behind the curve in terms of 
versionitis of what we have on our systems. And that's completely a problem within the Air Force itself. It has nothing to do with uh, DTC. But in the future, I would see that just improving upon verification techniques and providing new metrics that um, better exploit or tell the story of um, the forecast model data from the um, high res or convection allowing models would be great. Alex, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I do. I also posted in the, the channel, but just either Curtis or Chris. Um, so this is um, Alex Reinick at the Naval Research Lab. Um, I'm wondering how, if you can explain the workflow between DTC and UK Met Office and or how how the work, so, okay, so you're using Galwim, you're using UK Met Office model and DTC is your RDT and E partner. So if they identify through some verification um, study a deficiency in the model, how does that get fed back to UK Met and then ultimately get into your operational feed? Is that is this um, like, is this a formalized process where you say we need you guys to work on this or do you provide the inputs back to UK Met for them to, to work I'm on? I'm sort of out of the loop on this since I'm actually on, I'm not in the modeling group, I'm in the, on the model verification team, but I know that we have a liaison between the UK Met office and the 557th weather wing that provides input back and forth. So. That's about all I can say right now. I'd have to talk to some other people in the 16th weather squadron. But I would also, I would also say that I think a lot of the verification work that we have done via the, through the DTC is probably more on our, on our regional and higher resolution models. So that's, which is all wharf based. Um, I, I don't know. And this could, forgive me. I've only, I haven't been involved in this for too terribly long, but I'm not really sure what kind of verification projects, if you will, the DTC is doing related to GALWIM products. I think it most mostly is related to some of our higher resolution wharf based products. So, so it's actually been both in some respects. Yeah. And, and I would say that um, we haven't really been, so some of it has been looking at new ways of use of uh, more focused um, non-standard type fields so like cloud verification, dust verification, um, providing them with the approaches um, and, and helping them set up test plans. So some, some testing we are doing, um, but a lot of it is enabling the Air Force to do more thorough testing on their own so that then they can feed process back to model development. Um, because it's just, because it's not a model that we are, um, highly experienced at setting up and running where we're, the Air Force is the one running the tests for the most part. And if Michelle wants to chime in um, with anything else, she's welcome to. I think, Louisa, that you captured that fairly well. Um, we've mostly been, like you said, doing a lot of work with developing verification and validation methodologies Then we head off. Um, but we also um, are currently doing a a larger scale um, investigation of traditional verification on the land information system. But in that case, we've gotten access to um, one of the DOD machines. So we can actually do the verification on that machine of the full, full season data set. Thanks, Michelle. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna have us go ahead and move on, but um, you are welcome to type more questions in the Slack channel and, um, and Curtis and Chris, I mean, anybody who has um, and our staff are welcome to, to chime in on the Slack channel so we can keep the conversation going. So our next speaker is Hendrik Tolman um, and on the UFS Arto Stages and Gates. So Hendrik, take it away. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so I have an hour, right? Just kidding. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, normally when I talk about the UFS, I have a broad uh, range of things to uh, to cover. But of course, Luis already covered quite a bit of that. And also uh, Maui will talk uh, after me about EPIC. And so I'm uh, going to be talking about a very small part of the UFS here. And happy to answer questions broader later on in the, in the joint Q&A session. So next slide, please. 
<laughs> so bottom line up front on the UFS, uh, this is my only generic uh, UFS slide here. Uh, we as NOAA are moving to a unified forecast system approach for the things we're doing. There are three main reasons for that. They, um, uh, they are all uh, top level reasons. You can do them in any order you want to. But historically, we started looking at uh, simplifications of production suite. Uh, I just heard the word versionitis in the previous uh, talks on the Q&A site. Uh, we're trying to get away from that and to have a much more simple production suite. Uh, we also want to accelerate the research to operation pipeline uh, by doing research and operations with the same tools. And then we want to broaden the base, bring in more people to work on our uh, uh, the couple on the systems that we're using for both research and operations. And that's something that Luis already uh, mentioned a little earlier too. And so uh, I started uh, myself with this kind of stuff about seven years ago, although we called it something else at that time. And I'm uh, having the, the, the pleasure of having the job of being the main uh, uh, advertiser and cheerleader for uh, the UFS. And so for a while, this was just a, uh, a, a nice idea that we talked about, but it's become a reality. And um, uh, particularly it's become a reality we, because we have some real uh, applications that are <laughs> released and supported. Uh, Luisa talked a little bit about that. Uh, particularly the medium range and the short range weather applications. Uh, we have um, uh, a hurricane <coughs> analysis and forecast system and a prototype, co a prototype coupled system that are not released yet, but uh, the, the code base is fully available to anybody who wants to work with that. And um, we also, just as a little side effect, uh, uh, kind of interesting since what uh, Bob Holberg said early on, uh, yes, uh, UFS is a little weather focused, but we are rapidly moving into this coupling. And as part of the UFS, we just published a week ago a new 40 year uh, ocean ice uh, reanalysis. Uh, next, please. <coughs> and then the bottom line up front for what I'm talking about today. In 2018, uh, we, uh, we published a report as the UFS on organizing research to operations. It's time to take that a step further and to go really into the nitty gritty of what we're going on with that. Uh, we are developing uh, a three part report, one on assumptions, best practices and requirements, one on the technical aspects of the process and one on the governance, which is roles, responsibilities and expectations. They share a preamble and probably even more important, uh, we have documented a whole set of use cases that make it possible now for the broader research community to, to really look under the hood about what happens when we put something into operations. And uh, the reason for doing these reports is to first uh, take it the next step, then take a, a, an inventory of the things we're already doing to make this better and to identify the gaps that we have that we still need to put attention on. Next slide, please. So part one uh, is not a traditional report. It's really a, a gathering place of basic principles. And in the content, we talk about purpose and scope, the general assumptions, requirements, and constraints, the type of best practices that we are looking at and desired outcomes. These are things that in the broader community we've talked about for a long time, but we never really gathered them in one place. So that's the thing that's happening here. What is really new in this report is that we are starting to look a little bit more at risk management. Of course, it is something that becomes more and more important in the general governance of the of uh, the weather service operations in particularly in NOAA in general. So it's kind of nice to be able to uh, to start venturing into that a little bit in the UFS too. Uh, that's all I'm going to talk about for part one. Uh, next slide, please. So part two, uh, the content of this thing is, uh, part two is uh, about describing the process. And uh, uh, the starting point really has been uh, the little funnel on the top left, obviously too, too small for you to look at, but those of you who have been in the R2O world for a long while know that this is something that Louis Cellini put together to start linking, uh, particularly inside NOAA, uh, including the coll uh, collaborative institutes and things like that, uh, to work together, including the DTC and the test beds. Uh, this was kind of a view from a decade ago that, um, uh, that like I said, also put a nicely the DTC in place of this process. Uh, the other things that are really important for NOAA in this is the fact that we have a NOAA administrative order on how to work on and document uh, the R2O process. Uh, that means that we're working with readiness levels. Uh, there are nine readiness levels. I'll come back to that uh, when I come uh, to the following slides. Not yet, please. Um, um, uh, there are just, just a little bit too much granularity in that, and the readiness levels are written in a very generic way for any kind of transition. So we have been looking even in our 2018 and earlier uh, processes on uh, projects and, and reports on 
uh, getting it a little bit more uh, less granular. So we are looking at um, uh, five stages and five gates. Uh, that will be uh, the graphic on the bottom right. And the next slide, please, is the uh, the bigger version of that. So the blue uh, on the center here are the stages. So you go from stage one, which is the ideation, to stage two is the preliminary experiments you do with the modeling. Stage three is the pre-op uh, experimentation. Stage four is uh, moving towards uh, full operational uh, implementation by full testing. And then internally in NOAA, we have a stage five that moves those things really into operations. Uh, so you can see that we have mapped the readiness levels for NOAA to the stage, which is a somewhat loose readiness level, depending on how you uh, how you exactly interpret these readiness levels. And the important part for the governance is that you have to decide when you go from one stage to the other. Uh, that's where the gates come into place. Uh, these gates tend to uh, have a bunch of pre-steps that reach back into the previous stage. Therefore, you have an overlap here. So ideally, you would move from left to right over the top. Uh, you put it in operations. And then your customer requests, and your model errors, and your forecast priorities, and your science questions all come up with things that you want to do to go back and uh, uh, to an earlier stage. And so, so if the world is perfect, you just go through cycles all the time. In the reality, you may have to jump back every now and then. It's a really cyclical process. Uh, next click, please. And this is where the DTC lives. The DTC really lives for us in this stage three. Uh, the pre-operational experimentation and to prove that we are really there. But the DTC also, in some cases where we don't have the science ready, will bleed more into gate two and sometimes even gate one, uh, because that's the work we need to do. And in the ideal world where we're getting a little bit more with the hurricane forecasting at the moment, the DTC can do quite a bit of the pre-operational testing also that we need to do. So therefore the DTC really lives for us in stage in, in stage three, but clearly has a, a role in stages two and stages four too. Next slide, please. And so there are way many ways that you can describe this process on the previous slide. And there is no way to come up with a simple way to, uh, to have a single description of the whole thing. So instead we decided to take a bunch of use cases and uh, describe and document them rather than trying to make a one size fit all solution. And these use cases, we have 11 now of them, and they go, uh, the regular stages engaged, but also uh, with traditional applications, also with additional cases that don't really fit into uh, a normal operational implementation. So use case number one is the process for EMC to go to NCO. Uh, the fact that we have that available, but make it more available to the public will help our collaborators and our scientists to understand that process a lot better. Two, three, and four are different uh, examples of actual implementations, a global model and ensemble and a regional model. Uh, then five is a more structural example of uh, what we did to select a new die core. Uh, six is uh, working uh, with uh, the prototype uh, systems uh, uh, before we really have a really hard uh, uh, a commitment to get these things into operations. Uh, then we have a few things that are a little bit different. Uh, for us, in operationally important are things like a reanalysis and a reforecast. Uh, we look at something that is more a part of the process, which is the post-processing. We have an example in there describing what, what we needed on uh, stage one and the low readiness levels. Uh, we talk about an infrastructure example, in which case we use the CCPP. And we talk about some examples of people using community uh, modeling uh, software and therefore that could be done with the UFS also, that completely bypasses what NOAA is doing, but still contributes to our software stack. Next slide, please. And so then uh, the real uh, meat of the report is in the discussion and the conclusions. We talk about goals, metrics, and test plans. We talk about hierarchical testing. On the right, you see a picture of what is really closely related already to the, 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 through the DTC since uh, uh, we've been working with NCAR on uh, on uh, this kind of uh, more hierarchical testing program. Uh, and then there are a few things that we note that need to be discussed separately. Uh, that is code management, agile development, and the fact that uh, in NOAA, the readiness levels, uh, high readiness levels require us to actually do transition plans. And then last but not least, almost last but not least, in the discussion section, uh, there is a part uh, uh, that uh, basically goes back and so, okay, what does this mean for you if you're a developer? And then the real important part of this is the last part of the of the uh, of the uh, report, 
is a three pages of table information on all the action items that we need to get to a completely integrated uh, way of doing business. And uh, just for the record, when, since we're looking at this process here, we're really looking at what happens with a specific project and how it moves through the system. So next slide, please. So if we go into governance, it's not just one project anymore. It's many, many different projects. And it may be different projects than the ones that are described in the typical quote unquote Louis funnel for work that starts inside of NOAA and it ends in operations. You have different starting points that you can have. You can have different ending points that you can have. And therefore, there really is a constellation of funnels rather than one funnel. And moreover, the governance has to deal with the fact that there are many projects going in, but only a few coming out. And so, um, we uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, this uh, uh, by linking the gates and the, and the governance to roles, responsibilities, and expectations. And again, code management and funding are two issues that have to be discussed separately. Funding particularly because funding is, of course, the, the oil that greases the skids. Uh, but you have to realize that the UFS is not a, um, a funding opportunity. It's not a funded program. It is a coalition of the willing that happens to be funded by a lot of funding programs within NOAA and other places. And so it's important to set the roles, responsibilities, and expectations with funding right to. Next slide, please. And so the same thing here, rather than trying to have a one-size-fits-all solution, we looked at four specific use cases uh, and examples on use cases. The number one is all inside of NOAA, and we use as an example of the use case the UFS R2O project that already has been uh, uh, identified, we look at NOAA funding opportunities. The example that we're using is the Joint Technology Transfer Initiative. Uh, we look at external contributions that at a late stage came into NOAA. And as an example, we used uh, unstructured grid capability of the Community Wave Watch model that went into operations uh, and only NOAA started to work with that at literally stage four. And then we're looking at some of an example of where people are using uh, UFS code but are really not uh, directly linked to NOAA in any stage of the project to begin with. And um, uh, we have, again, a uh, summary of actions, uh, very similar and a similar structure as uh, report number two. Uh, so I won't go through that anymore, just to let you know that this added to a total of five pages now of content uh, of uh, things that we are already working on that need to be done. Next slide, please. A little bit of the review of that uh, on the top right, you see over the over the top the stages, over the bottom the examples. Uh, dark green means where the, the real focus of NOAA is. Uh, dark yellow means where the focus of the community is. So you can see that NOAA in general focuses on stage three, four, and five, and it has generally been recognized that NOAA research should be doing more on stages one and two. Uh, same with uh, the funding opportunities; they tend they tend to mostly focus like the DTC. Uh, on uh, stage three, but they bleed into stages two and four. Then when we have external contributions, NOAA suddenly becomes really interested only at stage four and five, sometimes at stage three. And even these things that completely bypass NOAA have a little bit of an uh, impact on stages four and five, both for NOAA and for uh, uh, the people uh, working in the community, uh, because NOAA gets a bunch of freebies even for that in terms of generally code improvements, code uh, reliability, uh, code efficiency and things like that. And uh, the people who are bypassing NOAA still get benefits from optimization and other things that we're doing in operations that feed back into the community. Uh, the big uh, table on the bottom identifies uh, in blue uh, what essentially the governance uh, responsibilities are in NOAA and in orange what is done in the community. And what you can see in both of these um, uh, uh, tables is a diagonal separation. Uh, click, please. And uh, that diagonal uh, between uh, the uh, community and between uh, NOAA uh, as a whole, this is really where DTC lives. And we really need uh, DTC to be that interface for us that makes sure that we are having that really good uh, UFS-based linkage between the community and broader NOAA. And in another presentation I did to the steering committee on this one, I would say exactly the same thing, but this is also where uh, the UFS steering community really wants to work more closely with the DTC on uh, doing the inventory uh, of uh, the projects that are there and on uh, uh, assigning uh, stages and on uh, acknowledging that gates have been passed. So um, these three reports were finalized for review late last week. Uh, we started sending this out to uh, uh, 
uh, about 60 or 70 reviewers uh, 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 yesterday. Uh, we uh, expect to get feedback back from the community and from the broader community of that uh, uh, in the next four weeks. Uh, but we are definitely still looking for people in the community uh, to uh, review that because most of this work, writing, writing work has been done by NOAA. And we're also looking particularly not only for people in academia, but for people in the commercial industry, although we have tagged a few people for doing that. I'll have a lot more I could talk about by, about uh, UFS, but uh, since uh, Louisa asked me to talk specifically about, uh, about the I2O, I'll try and stay a little bit in time and leave it at this. Uh, and you can click one more slide if you want. Back to Louisa. All right. Thanks, Hendrik. Um, do we have any uh, quick questions for Hendrik for now? I, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay. Um, so it must have been either very clear or very boring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Louisa. Um, yeah, and if there, if you think of anything else, go ahead and um, enter them in the in the Slack channel for today, and we can follow up with that. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll be on all today for questions. So okay, thank you. All right, so we will move on to um, Maui. You can take it away. Okay, thanks, Louisa. And I want to mention that actually what Hendrik just talked about uh, lay a very good foundation on what I'm going to talk about on the NOAA EPIC program. So um, I'm the program manager of the uh, Earth Prediction Innovation Center program. So to, this is a pretty new um, program within NOAA. So today I'm going to just um, basically introduce you to the program. Next slide, please. So um, this is EPIC is a program mandated by Congress. Um, I'm showing on the slides uh, um, to you the legislative mandates uh, from the Congress, also uh, mandates from NOAA. Um, to establish the NOAA EPIC program, as well as um, a link to a workshop that was uh, convened convened in 2019 on um, community uh, priorities uh, and needs uh, of this program. So I'm not going to uh, talk about everything in those mandates and documents, but I want to mention that uh, a few key items. Um, the program um, actually uh, is a direct response to the Weather Act in, in 2017. That bill requires NOAA to prioritize weather research to improve weather data, modeling, forecast, and warning for protection of life and property and enhancing um, national economy. And also uh, the same act uh, instruct NOAA to avoid unnecessary duplication between public and private sources of data and corresponding expenditures. So, um, Actually, the follow-up act, that is the National Integrated Drought Information System Reauthorization Act of 2018, specifically instruct NOAA to establish the EPIC program to accelerate community-developed scientific and technological enhancements into the operational applications for numerical weather prediction. So um, it called on NOAA through EPIC to do several things uh, that might be very important to, uh, to DTC as well as the broader community uh, to remove barriers to develop weather prediction models outside of NOAA, to enable better collaborations between scientists and engineers, to leverage existing NOAA resources and create a global weather research model that is accessible to the public and runs on supercomputers outside of the NOAA security boundary. So, um, it, so in, in these uh, mandates, uh, it is in the Congress mind for EPIC to provide a new paradigm to model development at NOAA for NOAA to include the external community through a more flexible framework for open innovation and open development. Through EPIC, NOAA is partnering with the community for the benefit of the nation. Next slide, please. 
So what is EPIC? Uh, exactly. So the vision, as I mentioned earlier, is to, for EPIC to enable the most accurate and reliable operational numerical forecast model in the world. And the EPIC's mission is to be the catalyst for community research and modeling system advances that continuously inform and accelerate advances in our nation's operational forecast modeling system. So, um, of course, right now we are talking about NOAA, only the operational system in NOAA, but hopefully there will advance uh, operational system in other agencies uh, through collaboration. So, um, uh, the funds mess up <laughs> in the circle that I, I'll read through it. So, in our mind, EPIC is a virtual community model development commu environment. EPIC will manage cloud-ready codes and provide community access to NOAA op observations, data, and tools uh, that include models, and uh, provide community support and engagement opportunities. We also, um, uh, actually this is clearly linked to what Hendrix just talked about, uh, to clear the research and model transition to operations priorities, uh, working with other NOAA uh, offices. And we do expect to expand to other uh, model components in addition to mid-range weather and short-range weather, but those are the two uh, applications we're going to focus on. We also focus on the unified forecast system, and uh, Hendrik just provided a very good overview on the system. So uh, next slide, please. So this is the EPIC innovation flow, which is closely tied to the funnel that uh, Hendrix just mentioned. So if you look at and start from the left hand side of uh, this diagram, you can see that a user from the community, uh, this person can, can be scientists, engineers and graduate students, any other collaborators within an external to NOAA. Uh, they can uh, work on a cloud de development environment to make an update to UFS, um, which is the second, second circle uh, on this diagram uh, to improve the skill scores. And uh, the UFS, UFS code repositories will be managed by EPIC and also uh, EPIC will clear um, the asset. So, to make sure the community is able to access cloud HPCs or in on prem uh, research and develop HPC systems within NOAA. And to test this update, uh, this user uh, is giving access to additional re retrospective um, of real time data. And, uh, and then, uh, if the test is successful, um, that specific development can enter the research to operations funnel on the, in the third circle, right? So that is when the, this um, readiness level um, uh, three uh, in uh, Hendrix diagram kicks in, right? So extensive scientific testing and validation uh, will be done at that stage and uh, core developers will identify the candidates for next operational release. And then eventually um, some um, development will get into the NSAP um, hardware for operational use uses. But while, but even if your code cannot get into operations, you still, so Epic will still provide that code management uh, capability so that you can keep your development up to date. Next slide, please. So what would be a success look like for EPIC? So as I mentioned, uh, we want to increase, increase the usage of the models um, because now the UFS code base is uh, an open re repository. So we are closely monitoring the downloads, community uh, code contributions, provide tutorials and uh, and also um, NOAA is actually supporting a lot of research projects uh, using uh, UFS. And then uh, the, the most important thing is for us through those innovation opportunities to improve forecasts. That includes synoptic scale forecasts um, as well as high impact weather events 
and uh, seasonal and sub-seasonal forecast. And, and with the EPIC as a platform, we want to foster long-range or system modeling uh, planning out to 10 years, as well as to provide the world's best forecast at all time scales and phenomena. And um, we, we hope to accelerate the rate of innovation from the external community by 50%. So all this actually takes an uh, entire community to, to make it happen, right? So um, NOAA or EPIC cannot do it alone. Next slide, please. And there are seven core investment areas under EPIC program. So you can see in the circle um, on the upper um, um, half of that circle, we have software infrastructure, software engineering, and user support services um, as three uh, important uh, areas. These are the areas we envision to, uh, for the EPIC contract which is actually awarded to Raytheon in, in intelligence and space um, to, to manage. And then uh, within the program, we will also work closely with uh, NOAA um, information, OCIO, uh, Office of Central Information uh, Computing, maybe, <laughs> uh, to, to enable cloud computing and make that available, uh, accessible to the uh, community. And then um, the program office also work, works closely with uh, the uh, EPIC contract to do uh, external uh, community engagement and uh, community building. And there are two other important functions that is um, um, conducted by the EPIC program office uh, only, that is the scientific innovation and the management and the planning of uh, this program. So uh, management and planning are very um, like typical uh, for, for a program office at NOAA, but I want to talk about the scientific innovation. Um, so those, in, in addition to the EPIC contract we awarded to ASEAN, uh, the EPIC program itself is actually supporting multiple uh, projects every year. That include a project awarded to DTC for us to work together on the transition activities, um, Luisa mentioned at the beginning of the meeting. And we're also providing support uh, for, for community contributions to ESMF. And uh, community modeling support, that, that is actually the code management piece, which is uh, led by EMC with contributions from GFDL, uh, PSL, and, uh, and the CIs uh, consortium. So some of these uh, model code management activities will be transitioned to EPIC, but, but I, I do think all of it will be transitioned. So that's um, our uh, management and planning activities uh, to, to scope it out. And uh, the EPIC program office is also provide um, the also manage the HPC support for OAR um, uh, as one piece that is very important to provide a uh, platform um, for external community. Um, also JCSDA. So we actually provide the uh, funding for JCSDA um, based um, uh, development and the management. So um, moving on to the key accomplishments, as I mentioned, um, this is a very new program. The program was established in 2019 and the uh, just following that establishment uh, in April 2019, uh, EPIC vision paper was published, uh, followed by an EPIC community workshop. Um, and then uh, in January 2020, in 20, we released the EPIC strategic plan. Um, but that plan has been like revised uh, by NOAA and also by Congress. Um, I'll uh, go back to that later. In March 2020, we released the uh, request for proposals. And in 
August, April 2021, the contract was awarded to Raytheon Intelligence and Space. So um, I know there are a lot of questions on what EPIC is, and that's actually the title that Luisa gave to me. That's partially because of this elongated um, period of uh, proposal review, and actually during that one-year period, uh, the EPIC program office was not allowed to release any information to the community, but we now get past that period. So that's why I'm here to discuss the EPIC program. And uh, so you can see that in between uh, that period, EPIC strategic plan was approved by the Hill. We're working on cre uh, create it up and release it to, through the EPIC website um, just in the next uh, few weeks. In August 2021, um, EPIC program office and the EPIC contract ho hosted um, multiple stakeholder meetings focusing on UFS activities. And in September, uh, which is uh, earlier September, um, the first EPIC program increment starts. Um, we, we are actually following a scaled agile framework um, in that implementation. Next slide, please. So um, just to provide some um, um, insights to the EPIC contract uh, year one activities. So I want to mention that uh, the contract we award, awarded to Raytheon is five year, but right now we are focusing on the year one activities. So um, it can be um, like uh, represented by the diagram I, I'm showing on this slide uh, with three key pieces. One is the web presence. So there will be a web-based EPIC community center portal. It will provide uh, engagement opportunities uh, with centralized access to EPIC content. That includes tutorials, social media uh, events, and a dashboard um, board showing UFS builds and um, test results integrated to advanced user uh, support features um, for help desk ass assistance. And we also will focus on multi-platform um, portability. Um, so in the first year, we we're gonna work on cloud-ready containerized UFS better model code base UFS applications and software infrastructure that will run across cloud uh, service providers that includes three uh, major providers, as well as NOAA high performance, high performance computers and also the HPCs in partner organizations. In fact, the NSF HPC will be one of the um, uh, HPC we're going to provide that support as well. And for the advanced user support piece, um, we're going to focus on containerized version, actually, as well as the cloud ready version once it's ready of the UFS and documentations. And the, all these will be made available via the EPIC uh, Community Center. And we're going to have dedicated uh, user support to provide um, the community uh, code development and uh, uh, opportunities. Next slide, uh, please. So what, so what should be expected in the uh, next year? So you are going to see the release of the finalized EPIC strategic plan. Um, we are trying to push it out before September 30th in the next two days. And um, public release of the EPIC community portal that will be our quarter one and most quarter two uh, goal to release that community portal. And uh, one thing I forgot, forgot to mention is that EPIC program is also managing the OAR Cloud uh, Tiger Team and the Cloud Incubator programs. So we are going to have a third annual OAR Cloud meeting um, in the coming um, months, um, actually in November as well. And we are actually working on establish an EPIC student program that includes uh, provide student fellowship uh, to graduate students who are interested in learning um, more about UFS as well as uh, JEDI. 
And also uh, in that scope, we're gonna provide travel grants for, stud for students to attend workshops related to UFS and uh, uh, JCSDA tools as well. And there are multiple workshops and symposiums and student workshops um, at AGU and AMS that are scheduled. Um, by the um, by April, we are going to release a five-year project management plan for the EPIC contract, which is going to focus in more on the software engineer platform piece. And in the summer, you're gonna see our invitation uh, for the second annual EPIC community workshop. By then, we're gonna have how ready and containerized the UFS uh, models for the community to to learn and also to comment on. And um, working with JCSDA, the program office will facilitate the initial public release of JEDI and um, also release the cloud ready UFS mid range weather application and hopefully followed by the short range weather application as well. And that's all I have. And thank you. And I will be here for any questions you may have. Thanks, Maui. Do we have any questions for Maui? Bob? Yeah, so there's been some confusion in the past about what Earth system uh, prediction or Earth system modeling involves. So for instance, the, um, the joint NOAA uh, DOD Earth system prediction capability was very much about physical prediction and did not include anything to do with prediction of the ecosystems or uh, on land surface, anything beyond just kind of short term physical change. Whereas, for instance, the community Earth system model at its heart is all about predicting changes within uh, the Earth system as a whole, including uh, biological changes within the context of EPIC. And I've read through the strategic plan. It's not clear which of those two definitions is the one that, that you see as the one that's following, which raises two questions. First, which of those two definitions more aptly describes your vision for EPIC? And secondly, in the context of the interactions of EPIC and DTC, is there scope for DTC to need to kind of expand um, its range of capabilities to match what EPIC is looking for? So I have a very simplified uh, response to that, not because I'm not waiting to respond, many because I feel like this is something we're hoping to get additional community inputs, right? But uh, if you look at through the congressional mandate, we are asked to focus on whether uh, applications defined in the Weather Act. That means we're going to focus on short range weather, uh, mid, mid range weather up to uh, sub seasonal to seasonal scale, right? If we can get that successfully done within, well, five years might not even be <laughs> enough, we can expand to other applications. But at this stage, for programming uh, that just get started, we're, I don't think it's wise to overpromise, but on the other hand, there is a, a parallel, um, there are parallel um, discussions within the UFS steering committee, also NOAA modeling board, also EPIC will support um, um, a community modeling board to provide us uh, inputs. Uh, to where we should go if we get the first set of acti activities implemented. I'm open to uh, future discussions, but based on the current mandate, we probably should be more focused. If, if, if I may respond to that too, because that was an epic slash UFS question, I think. Yes, uh, go ahead, Hendrik. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, on the UFS side is definitely the, uh, the, the non-climate definition of Earth system modeling to begin with, but having said that, we actually having discussions right now about a few things. One of them is the, the expansion of the six component models to include marine ecosystems and uh, space weather. Uh, that is something that we already identified a few years ago. Uh, we're also uh, talking with, uh, uh, with uh, um, the broader community and particularly with GFDL on uh, whether or not we have to have longer timeframe applications in the UFS. Uh, and uh, 
in that context, uh, I think we will eventually uh, get to that could get to that point where uh, hopefully the definitions become the same for the, for both teams. But I completely agree with Maui that we have to uh, we have we have to uh, look at making sure that we follow the words of the Weather Act. But we can do all the couple of modeling within that because you cannot really propagate weather much further without doing that. So th those are the, the the two or three little side points there. But uh, yeah, we're well aware of the different in the. Uh, the, the use of the word for different communities and uh, we really need these are things that we have active discussions on thank you, thank you. um i think hoya is next hi yeah thank you i'm maui so uh it's good to hear that by the end of 22 fy 22 uh epic is uh planning to provide technical events um user support so is this support going to include infrastructure, technical, scientific support, all of them? Um, so the EPIC contract has many software engineering support, as well as uh, somebody who is really familiar with HPC and how to optimize code. So I have to say, uh, yes, it's going to include like code management, provide the CI CD pipeline. So if anyone commit uh, uh, a development, it can be easily tested, but I do not expect scientific um, user support to happen that has to be supported by a scientist. Uh, right now, it's not within the scope yet for that user support capability. Okay, thanks for the clarification. So mostly it's going to be some sort of um, infrastructure support, really. Right, okay. right. Gotcha. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Julio? Yeah, I guess my question is sort of related. Um, I'm trying to understand uh, what you mean. You know, I, I, I'm trying to understand uh, what what you're going to provide uh, under these containerized versions of the model. Uh, it sounds to me like you guys want people to download UFS and run it so they can do research. Um, That's correct. So are these containerized versions of the model going to run on, you know, Macs or, or do people need, are people going to need access to your computers? I, I, I'm wondering, you know, what sorts of, what sorts of configurations will be available? Have people thought about this? Are you talking about single column models, low resolution versions of a coupled model? I just I kind of, I'm curious about more details about what the containerized versions might actually be. So, so Julio, thanks for that question. We actually had a lot of discussions on that in our very first uh, PI planning event. Uh, I would go back to the proposal from Raytheon to start with. Um, they wrote that proposal two years ago. By then, they thought we need to containerize everything, right? Include the cloud-ready uh, versions. But um, when, when we had the meeting, uh, when we had that event earlier this month, um, people within NOAA are asking, since we are having this parallel work, para work uh, framework, uh, provide um, basically uh, support for all three cloud platforms, why we need a containerized version for each of the cloud uh, provider. So we are revisiting that definition. But, but getting back to your question about containers, yes, we are hoping to get uh, a, a container at least for your um, uh, personal uh, laptop and also some of the um, uh, of the HPC systems right now we are not supporting right so that's a goal but um, but we can we can we'll need to come back and revisit that uh, once we understand all the constraints and all and opportunities and redefine what, what we mean by container, uh, containerization. Does that answer your mm -hmm. question? Yep, thanks. You're welcome. Um, Lisa? Thank you. And um, thank you for these two nice presentations. Uh, hearing them back to back, it is a little bit challenging to disentangle the difference of the UFS and the EPIC programs. There's a strategic plan, there's a, <laughs> I see Henrik is excited. I don't know. I think uh, 
Epic has its own strategic plan. It's it sounds like a lot of what you're saying with these containerized version and already exists with these public released version of the UFS and uh, the main difference seems to be the focus on getting this in the cloud. Is that am I interpreting that correctly? Um, if you look at my slide, I've said portability, right? So mm -hmm. so. Even if Epic is not the one who support everything in NOAA in terms of uh, infrastructure uh, for modeling, model codes and testing evaluation, we'll need to work with this team to make sure the UFS code is portable and, and do not break anything um, when we make it available to you on the cloud platform. So we are still discussing that, but I see that Hendrik has his hand up. He might have an answer for you for UFS. Yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, I, I, was, I was cheering because the whole idea is that Epic and UFS can only be successful if they are really like that and nothing else. And mm -hmm. so, so the, the UFS side, uh, we also just published a, a, a 2022 to 2025 strategy in april uh and uh we got a a little bit disjointed because it took so long to get uh the raytheon contract uh, uh awarded uh but we're well, well aware of the fact that we can only be successful uh if we if we are a complete one-two punch and so so a lot of what we're doing with the ufs is getting input from the broader community a lot of what we're doing with but that is community and talking about what you want to do Epic is actually a funded a funded program, and so Epic is there, and Epic very clearly in that first circle that was a little bit uh, clobbered by the by the by the formatting, it clearly says it's not going to put up a new model. It's all about making the UFS successful, and so the UFS as a community works together and makes planning, but does not have the authority of the funding. Epic Epic is a funding opportunity or a funding resource that helps us accelerate that and. Uh, the first, the first things we are trying to do with Epic, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the first things we're doing is getting this infrastructure in place, getting the codes he healthy, and making sure that everybody can work together. And if you look at what in 2019 we were talking about, that is stage one of Epic, getting uh, getting everything in place. Stage two of Epic, if we can if we can convince uh, the Hill for that, would be a much larger Epic where we also would be starting to do a lot of research with it. But right now it's all about having the resources to do the work, to take what was used to be poorly documented, non-portable, one-off things that we had in the production suite to being world-class uh, uh, community modeling efforts that you can put on your computer in a matter of a day. And to go back to what Julio, uh, Julio said a little earlier, uh, the idea of doing releases and doing container, containerization is to allow people who have very little background this, in this to very quickly be able to play with it and do research. Uh, last week, we had a week-long workshop, uh, training workshop uh, by, the, by the same folks here on uh, our short-range weather application. And we had that same discussion. Uh, why do you have the application? Because the application is just a snapshot. In the meantime, we have the code stack that is managed through GitHub in such a way that it's always up to date and highly agile. And so you take the applications and you take uh, uh, the containerized versions to get to used uh, to work with it on your system in a simple way. Once you know how to do that, you switch back to, uh, to going to the, the core GitHub way of doing business. And it remains to be, and, and instead of doing the application, and we'll have to see whether it's really how much value there is in the containers or that people who want to do development are going to say that they're going to skip and bypass that step. But uh, that is something uh, we, we're following the best practice of the industry right now. And we'll see how well this works for us uh, at that point. And we'll take the next step uh, when we have that information and the data about how well this works. I hope that helped a little bit, Julio, too. So, um... <clears throat> We're blowing through our break right now. I do see two more hands raised. Um, and I, Becky and Chris, could you enter your questions in the Slack channel for today? And then um, Maui and Hendrik, would you be able to um, 
read those. There are a couple more questions in the Slack channel um, addressed to um, Maui. I, I hate to blow all the way through our break because um, I know everybody, I know I need to get out of my chair. Um, so I, I want to be um, cognizant of that. So how about we do that? And um, we'll come back in, um, oh, how about 10 after? Um, the hour. Um, we'll start back up. We, we do have a lot of time period for discussion, so we can also revisit some of these things later if um, if need be. Does that sound like an okay plan? Anybody have a problem with